Mindset is talked about a lot, of course. It's great. Let's keep talking about it. And very frequently, it's held at this on this big picture macro scale conversation. It's this thing we know we need to get better at. And uh, how do we do it? And there's that confident person over there. Man, that looks fun. Uh, and I'm over here. Whoops, would have been nice. Right. What do I do? What do I do? Right. When we add in the conversation about what words to use more of and why, and we got more of this coming, folks, Mm -hmm. what words to use less of and why, then mindset becomes practical. I can practice thinking, speaking, and and typing, writing differently in ways that are going to help me stay focused on the things that are important, keep the drama low, build myself up in my imagination, the good stuff. Hello, and welcome to Pursuing Health. I'm Dr. Julie Fouché, family physician and former CrossFit Games athlete. Here, I bring you information and inspiration to help bridge the gap between fitness and medicine and support your journey toward your healthiest self. Before we dive into the episode, I do want to make it clear that this podcast is for general information only and does not provide medical advice. I recommend that you seek assistance from your personal physician for any health conditions or concerns. All right. Welcome to Pursuing Health. I am very excited to be here today with Mark England. Thank you for taking the time. And I'm excited for this conversation. I'm excited to learn more from you. And particularly, I'm already finding myself second guessing every word that I say, because I know how much you learn and teach about our language and how important that is. So this will be fun. It, it will be fun. Um, and thank you for having me on. Uh, thanks everybody in advance for listening. And uh, yeah, p- please speak freely. <laughs> no judgment here, only learning. Yeah. So let's just dive into that. You, I know you've had the title or you've been called a language geek. So can you tell us a little bit about what that means and how you came into this work? Well, that specific title was, was a joke. Uh, initially. So I was introduced on stage uh, for, for a, a, a TEDx talk that we did in 2017. I'm, I'm friends with the people that produced TEDx mm-hmm. RBA. And she said, you know, we don't want to talk about procabulary. Uh, what, what would you, what, what would you like, how would you like to be introduced? And I just shot a text back, a language geek. I didn't think they were going to do it. <laughs> they did it. And there was, um, it's, it actually, it actually fits because I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm a nerd with this stuff. I fell in love on site the first time I ever saw what we call story work done, uh, which was in 2003 on an island in the Gulf of Thailand called Koh Samui. I was there doing a cleanse. Um, it's a great gig. You pay to not eat for seven days, you know, it's, uh, and it was a... <laughs> There was a, a, a gentleman doing an emotional detoxification workshop and Mark and all his wisdom, I snickered at the name of emotional detox. Right. Who I, needs that? <laughs> come on. You know, I was this, I, I thought I was a tough guy in uh, high school and college and I wrestled and got into jujitsu and uh, Thai boxing and competed and did pretty okay. And then I moved to Thailand and, you know, the whole, whole dream, Julia becoming a professional fighter, it mm-hmm. uh, crashed and burned. Now, and I didn't laugh for an entire year. Like I, oh, I, I wow. went over, yeah, it was, that's a really weird experience. I don't, yeah. I, I don't negation acknowledge recommend that. Uh, and that is what happened. So briefly I move over there. I was going to stay for a year, practice Thai boxing, come back home and go pro six months in, I have my second knee surgery and the whole thing's done. And, um, I used that major, it was the, it was the biggest fail of my life at that point in time. And I use that as the final piece of proof. And we talked about a telephobia yesterday on the phone. It was the final piece of evidence that there really was something wrong with me. I'm doomed to fail and I'm not good enough. It was never going to work out. Why'd you even try dummy? And I entrenched this, this major victim mentality. And it took up the entirety of my mental real estate. Uh, it, it was extremely just heavy, dense emotions, just stress in the whole time. I just saw my life as a way to like the rest of it was you know, go throw in the towel to use a pun from. Um, and after a year that I got sick of it 
And I went down and did this cleanse and it, uh, uh, I, I, I got some, I felt better. So my third trip down, I kept going there. Uh, I was a, a elementary school PE teacher in, in Bangkok. Mm-hmm. So I had the time to go down there. The third trip down, I, I went to this emotional detox workshop and I saw this man walk this woman through a legit stinger of a breakup story. And, uh, so he walked her through it three times. The first time he let her go, uh, uh, just a, just a, uh, uh, she told the story with no input from him. And she was, she was crying and, and tears, um, very angry. Second time through, he started to adjust the language and you could see the story start to loosen up. Third time through, he had her stop at the Lord of the Rings sentence. So the sentence that forced her to to take his actions personally, make it about her, uh, create the victim villain dynamic, which is very common when we tell stories to ourselves about events in certain ways. And that sentence, and he made very, he made it very clear to everyone that he was, this, this was the sentence to pay attention to. He did that to me. He did that to me. And he said, take out that last word. He said, take out me and put in himself. And everything changed almost in an instant. It was such a radical departure from the story um, that she, it was clunky when she said it. And it, it went up at the end like a question. He did that to himself. Then you see the story catch. And then he did. He did do that to himself. And she takes this sigh of relief. And she, she said, and then she, she shares, you know, he lost friends because uh, he cheated on her and, and all this stuff. It was very public. It was messy. And then she finally, she goes, you know what? It was never going to work out anyway. Cause the guy was really weird. And I saw that and I said, that's not my story, but that's my story. And I've been nerding. So back to language geek, I've been nerding on this stuff ever since. That is amazing. So many questions. Can you give, can you just give some more context around that story and what the impact then was, and then maybe we'll go into your story, but what the impact was on that woman from making that change in that one word um, on her whole sort of life identity existence, how that affected her. Happily. So the definition, I'm going to take a little bit out of the middle. This is the verbatim definition of the victim mentality. The victim mentality is an acquired personality trait where a person tends to regard himself or herself as the victim of the negative actions of others, even in the absence of clear evidence. The victim mentality depends on a habitual thought process and attributions. Again, I took a little out of the middle. That's the verbatim definition of the victim mentality. Most people have never heard it. That second sentence is right between the eyes, right where it belongs. The victim mentality depends as in it has to have a habitual thought process. Habitual accurately implies duration and addiction. So working backwards, if there's a habitual thought process, also known as thoughts, thinking sentences, that the victim mentality has to have, what are those habitual thoughts? And what she did right there, she used something called a projection. And a projection is going to force someone, regardless as nothing to do with intelligence or dessert. It's simply a matter of education. That sentence would force me or Einstein to create victim villain mental imagery. He did that to me. He's in the picture. I'm in the picture. He's doing something to me. I have to wait for him to stop, change his behavior so I can feel better about myself. Don't hold your breath, folks. Or um, you never let me think for myself. Same thing. They're in the picture. I'm in the picture. Um, I, had a, I had a woman come in and, and, and the, the sentence that held her story together was, um, my husband made me think we needed to get married. Talk about disempowering. Mm-hmm. And guess what we did? We took out the he and put in I, or my husband, and put in I. I made me think we needed to get married. And that had a lot. Uh, it changed the context immediately. Mm-hmm. It changed the mental imagery, what she was seeing. It changed uh, her emotional status and it unlocked her breathing. So we talked about this on the phone yesterday as well. Uh, We went on Barbell Shrugged in 2017 to talk about this one thing. 
if you change some seemingly everyday ordinary language, you're going to improve, you're going to improve your breathing, which is important when it comes to fitness, longevity, positive, healthy relationships, you name it, sleep, digestion. Did you, did you know that the two, I forget the order, the two most commonly purchased over the counter medications in the United States are, um, indigestion medication and constipation medication. Mm-hmm. And, and that's because people hold their breath. Yeah. 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 And our, yeah. our nervous system. Absolutely. So I'm curious just to continue on, on your story, how then when you heard this woman change her story and change her language, how you then applied that to your situation and what that unlocked for you? I had a story. It was different, of course, in one sense. It was also similar as far as the, the syntax of the language, the way the, the words were, uh, I was using the words. I had a story where uh, about the, the time when I got hurt, that guy shouldn't have kicked me that hard. We were warming up. And, um, you know, I blamed him. I took zero responsibility for, uh, training when I should have been resting. Okay. Mm-hmm. Which also dovetailed back into why I was such a maniac back then with the fight game. I was using, I was fueling my workouts with a lot of trash talk in my head, uh, about myself. And I was using fitness as a way to prove my self-worth that in and of itself is essentially, uh, uh, very stressful in nature. And, uh, none of this stuff is rocket science. Okay. Anytime people are holding their breath or having poor breathing mechanics while they're, you know, exercising it, it, it vigorously, the, the likelihood of injury goes way up. I mean, when I, when I look back, I, I ended my fight career because of my unresolved emotional issues with myself that it, that got set up way before I ever started fighting. And so I was able to go in and, and write those stories down, which is the fastest way to, to get clarity when it comes to the stories that we're telling ourselves about ourselves, also known as our identity. Mm-hmm. It's the fastest way to get clarity about that stuff. And with a little bit of, um, a little bit of education to go back to that word about how our words influence us for better and for worse, we can start to make um, changes in our, in, in our language, in our thoughts, in what we say, what we write. And it adds up. And it's fun too, because it feels good. <laughs> it's powerful. So can you take us through what that looked like then for you from going from this place of using fitness as a way to prove your self-worth to you know, the victim mentality of, of this guy shouldn't have kicked me as hard as he did to then how you changed that and, and changed both your words and your identity. Some of those things happen faster than others. Um, and, uh, one of the best things that this work has helped me do is to unlock my breathing. I keep, keep coming back to that. So when we talk about language, how it influences us for better and for worse, what aspects of ourselves does it influence? We keep things very simple. I'll I'll give ourselves a pat on the back. We've done a good job of demystifying the conversation about identity or mindset and also gamifying it. So our language influences four main aspects of our experience of ourselves: our imagination, our feelings and emotions, our physiology. And also our breathing. Mm -hmm. And as I went into two of the most foundational stories of why I needed to fight was two specific moments in elementary school where fights broke out on the playground. I remember the guy's names, Danny Potter and, and Steve Rinelli. And I ran the other direction and I secretly framed myself and blamed myself as a coward all through my teenage years for that. And once I got introduced to um, wrestling and then jujitsu and things like that, I was using that as a band-aid for those, those um, 
quote unquote deeper stories or stories that had preceded that. Um, and, and what I was able to do is write those stories down and go through a process of making some edits in the, in the, in the words I was using. That is really powerful and something I can relate to as well. And I think going back to this, you know, I told you before, I hadn't heard of it, a telephobia, the word that specifically before this fear of not being good enough, but I think it is at the root of, um, for so many people, I mean, maybe everyone and how that really gets laid down or these stories that we create is laid down usually from something that happens in childhood that then creates this subconscious sort of belief or story that we again, perpetuate with our thoughts and, and behaviors and language. And, um, you know, for me, it was a similar type of situation. I think, well, it wasn't in elementary school, it was later, but when I went back and was able to realize that moment where I, something happened between me and someone who was my friend in school growing up that I then took on this identity of I'm not good enough and how that then perpetuated different actions and decisions that I made going forward in life. And so I just want to take a moment to just really hone in on that and how, how these patterns start. It's usually something that is not necessarily a a conscious thing that happens. It's usually something that started much younger and is just perpetuated. Very much so. And, and most people I'm making an assumption and it's also a, um, an educated guess uh, because we do a lot of work with people in the fitness industry is that most people can relate to using exercise at some point in time to make up for something. Okay. We even have the language in our language and exercise my demons, exercise demons. If I don't exercise, what happens? I go crazy, you know, and um, there's, there's a, there's a big difference between exercising to make up for a shortcoming or multiple shortcomings um, or, or, uh, and, and, and exercising um, to improve one's health and, and, and physical physical fitness. They're Absolutely. they're two different approaches. They're two different outcomes. One has one has a lot of longevity to it. The other does not. And where intention is so important, and I think is a process that I've gone through myself, and I've seen many other people go through this process. And recently had a conversation with someone in a way that made sense to me to just ask, why are you doing the exercise? Is it, like you said, a way to prove your self-worth or a a way to try to control or try to perfect? Or is it coming from a place of self-love and truly trying to, like you said, promote health and longevity and and sort of serve these healthier purposes? Would you like to play a language game? I would love to, please. Very very fun, very simple. Everybody, you're, you're, you're invited to play also, and just on an important side note, I am a teacher to the core. Uh, I have uh, a master's degree in education. I was an elementary school sports teacher before I got into this line of work. And so I approach every opportunity like this podcast um, as an opportunity to teach. And these la- this language game, we're going to play a couple if, you're, if it's okay with you. Sure. Very fun, very simple. They do a great job of creating creating an experience for someone about what happens when they change their language. So everybody feel free to write along with us. And if you like these language games, you want to make Mark England even happier, turn around and share them because they're easy. <laughs> okay, so do, you have a, do you have a pen and paper by chance? Oh, let's see. I could grab one. Let me grab one. We're about to play the one word game, folks. Well, one of one of several. Oh, I'm so excited. <laughs> this might be the first time we've ever played a game on the Pursuing Health podcast. Yeah, there's this whole thing about games and fun. And when people are having fun, they tend to tend, tend to tend to keep playing. And and here's here's <laughs> a promise, everybody. If you make some seemingly minor adjustments in your everyday ordinary language, just a few here and there, you're gonna feel the difference. And it will take this conversation from something theoretical and intellectual into something experiential. There's a very big difference there. Okay. So write this sentence down, everybody. 
How can I ever get over this? How can I ever get over this? Got it. Read that sentence, Julie, please. How can I ever get over this? How does it feel to say that? Um, kind of feel feeling. sort of hopeless. Yeah. Yep. I don't know if that's what you're going for. That's ex- <laughs> hey, that's, that's exactly what I expected because having done this one language game with thousands of people, it is extremely reliable in the sense that most people react that way to that sentence. How can I ever get over this? It feels daunting. It feels impossible. It gets a sinking, hopeless feeling. Cool. Now take your magic wand, also known as your pen, and scratch out one word. Remember, everybody? One word game. Scratch out the word ever. Mm-hmm. Now read it. What happens? How can I get over this? Any difference? Yeah, it sounds like exciting, like a challenge, like something to figure out. Mind if we get techie for a second? Sure. Cool. So both of those sentences are presuppositions. They presuppose something. And yes, fine. There's a question mark at the end of the first sentence. Well, both of them. When someone has the word ever in there and they emotionalize over it, it's not a question. It's a statement. How can I ever get over this? It's a statement of I'm screwed. Okay. The second one, also a presupposition. It presupposes that there are there there are exits, there are answers, there are solutions. So uh, uh, how can I get over this? My here's the tech part. My reticular activating system, or RAS for short, is activated differently by both of those statements. And the reticular activating system to keep it very simple, is a lens. And it has a couple of uh, very important functions. It has a search function and it has an edit function. My car got stolen in 2017. I was walking out my front door to go give a presentation. I walk over to where my car was parked the night before. It's gone. So I call the police and I said, help. They said, hold on, buddy, we're coming. And then I call my dad. I said, dad, this is really weird. And I'm, I'm telling the truth. Somebody stole my SUV. I've got stuff to do. I need the farm truck. So this is in Richmond. I drive out to my family's farm and pick up one of my father's prized possessions. 1985 Ford F-150, two tones of brown, call it brown and browner. It's in mint condition. (laughs) I drive brown and browner into Richmond. And in 24 hours, most people have had a similar experience with a vehicle before where I'm going with this. In 24 hours, Julie, I was seeing 1985-ish Ford F-150s seemingly all over the place. Mm-hmm. Have you ever had that experience, by the way? Mm-hmm. You get a new car and then you're like, where are all these cars coming from? Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> it, it, what, what, what vehicle was it? Just out of pure, pure. Oh, I, I mean, I don't know. I guess, uh, I don't know if I've had it with a car specifically. But I know what you're talking about, or like you hear about something. Maybe now it's just our phones are listening to us and Instagram's showing us the things we yeah, talk about. Cool. But <laughs> but I've had that experience um, in the real world too. <laughs> most, most people have. I was on a podcast yesterday, and the and, and the guy said, "Yeah, Subaru Forester. I got one uh, a year ago, and now I'm waving to people with Foresters and stuff." That's mm-hmm. the reticular activating system. So that's the search function when. We, when, when we focus on something and this it's for better and for worse, it's completely impartial. When we focus on something, especially if we emotionalize over it, it gets deemed as important. And the reticular activating system goes on a search and edit mission. So it goes looking for more of those things, also known as confirmation bias, and it starts editing out anything that's not that. So while my, I was seeing more and more of these trucks, where are they all coming mm-hmm. from? It was editing out blue Oldsmobiles red beetles. I wasn't seeing any of that. And this has been, this has been, this is a very important in my, take it or leave it, my personal and professional opinion, piece of information about the RAS for anyone that's um, interested in personal development, professional development, coach people. Uh, 
because this is absolutely at play with your, with your clients. And it's been studied extensively. The most famous study with the reticular activating system is the invisible gorilla study. So are you familiar with this by, by, mm -hmm. way, by chance? No. This is really cool. In the late 1990s, two social psychologists took seven college students and made a one minute video. Took three dressed. Uh, yep. Yeah, I have heard this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> three of them up in white, three in black, and then one in a gorilla costume. And they gave the white team two basketballs, the black team two basketballs, and then they filmed them passing the balls back and forth to their own team for one minute, 30 seconds in. They send in the, the student in the gorilla costume to turn and look at the camera, beat his chest and walk out. That was the one minute video. And then they, they, they uh, show this one minute video to tens of thousands of people. And they give them, um, they, they direct their attention somewhere, also known as giving them a task. They said, how many times does a white team pass the basketball back and forth? And then, you know, they watch the video at the end, they ask them and they go, oh, by the way, did you happen to see that gorilla? Mm -hmm. 50, five, zero, 50 percent of people edit out something so seemingly obvious as uh, a gorilla because they're not looking for it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, the drum, I already answered the question. And the question is, does the reticular activating system only respond to Subaru Foresters and 1985-ish uh, Ford F-150s and, and, and college students in gorilla costumes? Or is our language influencing our reticular activating system too? Absolutely. And that's why, that's the, the science behind visualization too, right? Visualizing, you know, whether it's in sports or any other area of life, seeing the outcome that you you know, want or how you would react to a situation, then your body's primed to act that way. Thousand percent. And we're in the, in the business, <clears throat> excuse me, of helping people craft, construct their language. So it's easier to see those things that they want. Mm -hmm. Mindset is talked about a lot. Of course, it's great. Let's keep talking about it. And very frequently it's held at this, on this big picture, macro scale conversation is this thing we know we need to get better at and uh how do we do it and there's that confident person over there and that looks fun uh, and i'm over here whoops would have been nice right what do i do what do i do right when we add in the conversation about what words to use more of and why and we got more of this coming folks mm -hmm. what words to use less of and why then mindset becomes practical i can practice thinking speaking and and typing writing differently in ways that are going to help me stay focused on the things that are important, keep the drama low, build myself up in my imagination, the good stuff, unlock my breathing. I love it. Would you be able to take us through some of that? What, what the outline of those mechanics look like and how you walk people through this process? Absolutely happy to. And we've already started with that, um, uh, uh, that first language game, you want to play another mm -hmm. one? Sure. Cool. I'm all in. All right, everybody. You're welcome to play along too, because you can. Uh, <laughs> write down, this is called soft goals. Okay. Write down two goals for the rest of the year. Okay. And write them down in full sentences. So I want to, I will, however you want to say it. I could, I can, I'm going to. Um, start this new business endeavor, or I will take a family trip to Croatia, or I'm going to compete in three Spartan races, whatever they are. So write down, write down two goals. And this ladies and gentlemen is also a very also uber reliable language game. I'm giving you the layups, the absolute layups. And then we'll, we'll play a should detox and, and yeah, hat trick magic, magic number three. And like I said, when people have a as the old saying goes, she who feels it knows it. And one of the things that we're doing here is we're, and it's very rare because I pay attention to who's talking about what in, in, the, in the context about mindset. We are slowing down the storytelling process to a degree where we can pay attention to what words are influencing us. Most people use their language uber fast, very quick. And it, it robs them of the mental real estate, the time to make, to connect the dots between 
what words are serving them and what words are uh, in their way. All right. I'm interested to see how this goes. <laughs> Everything's on the line. <laughs> what's, what's, what's the- I'm going to learn how to revamp my goals here. All right. My first one is I will initiate more than 100 random conversations. Perfect. How's that feel to say? Good. It makes me feel confident. Wonderful. See how complicated this is. Read the next one. I will meditate every morning. Perfect. How does that feel to say? Good. So that first sentence, that first goal, put a kind of anywhere in there. The word kind of. So the first language game, we took a word out and had an experience. Uh-huh. This language game, we're putting a word in. I will initiate more than 100 kind of random conversations. <laughs> yeah, the, the laugh says a lot. What happens when you put kind of in there? Uh, there's a little bit of um, just lack of clarity. Like maybe I'll count this as random. Maybe I won't. Ooh. I don't know. Let's go to that next one. Oh, no. <laughs> in that next one, let's go with a guess. Put the word guess in there. Anywhere. Guess. Like just guess or well the word guess, so I guess. I guess. Can I add another I? I guess I will. Perfect. Meditate every morning. Wait, wait a way to really motivate yourself there, Julie. I, I guess. guess. Meditate there uh, uh, every morning. This, ladies and gentlemen, is an elephant in the room. It's the gateway drug to all of your language is the easiest place to start. It's called soft talk. Mm -hmm. And there's a handful of soft talk keywords. And I promise you, they're in your language. I promise you, they're in your members language. I promise you, they're in in your client's language. They're unaware of them. And they are driving a lot of indecision and anxiety. Okay. Prolonged bouts of indecision, very stressful. It's a certain flavor of stress. Uh, One of my favorite quotes from um, uh, it's hard for me to pronounce the guy's name, but Mal- Malmody is. He said, I prefer the fear of making the wrong decision to the terror of indecision. So these keywords, folks, we just, we just did soft goals. I'm going to rattle off the 10 or so soft talk keywords. Write them down five times larger than you normally write on a clean sheet of paper, if you can. And then put this up for seven days. This is the soft talk challenge. And what's going to happen? It's going to raise your awareness, the low reticular activating system, about these words. And you're going to start to see them and hear them. And then, and then you're going to think, oh, my God, that language geek was serious. Yes, this language geek is very serious and sincere. So here are the words. Think. Might. Guess. Maybe. Sort of. Kind of, possibly, probably, almost like, it's almost like I'm procrastinating. (laughs) (laughs) Hopefully, should, and try. And here's, my, here's one, another, another marking on promise. If you take, it'll take you about three months. If you cut your soft talk keywords in half, you will double your confidence. And anyone listening, you would double the confidence. You're the right kind of monster. As in the drama is lower. You're more focused. You sound different. You will sound different. Absolutely. Feel- and you have clarity. There's, I think, part of these, when you don't have clarity with yourself about what you're going to do or you don't do, then it makes it confusing oh, to know, well, what, what am I going to do? Maybe I'm going to do this. Maybe I'm going to do this. Oh, it's, 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 it's very confusing. Um, it's like I said, it's very stressful. You know, here at Enlifted, we're about the how. We're mm-hmm. about the how. There's a big difference between why do I talk myself out of opportunity? 
so much? And how do I talk myself out of opportunity? Mm-hmm. I want to know the how. The, the why is open. You ask 10 people, uh, why do I do this? You're going to get 10 different opinionated answers. You ask 10 people, how am I doing it? You're going to get no answers because the average person will currently, this, this conversation really is, is, is catching on about the power of our words, how they influence us for the worse and what to do about it. It's, it's, in, it's where the rubber meets the road with, with mindset and you add it in, it. you've got something practical as in you can practice it. Most people's language is working against them and they don't even know. They, they don't even know what's happening. And it's like I said, it's an education issue. I got brought up in the public school system. I have a degree in education. I didn't have one course, class, or conversation, Julie, on either side of that fence on how to use my language to build myself up in my imagination or my mm-hmm. feelings and emotions. Most, and that, most people fall into that category as well because I've asked a lot of people. Most people's training education about their language comes down to traditional spelling, grammar, and definition. You want to talk a little bit of woo real quick? Sure. Woo. Why not? We're here. Why not? So, I'm all in. Right. I'm living down in Ecuador in 2013 out to lunch with friends. And there's a guy at the table. He was new uh, in, in our, in our uh, uh, social scene. He knew the work I did. And he goes, Hey man, uh, you know what abracadabra means? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Magic. And he goes, no, it's way cooler than that. I said, oh, what? And he said, yeah, abracadabra is Aramaic which is an ancient language is still spoken in some areas of the Middle East currently. It's the language the original Old Testament was written in. And it translates to with my word I create or with my word I influence. Wow. I know, right? The mind blowing. Right. The the hair on the my 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 neck, my arms, I put my fork down, I went over to the other side of the table, said, bro, tell me everything. He said, they triangulate it and wear it around their neck. I don't know if you can All see. All right. It. Yeah. I've mm-hmm. seen it on your website too. I was wondering where that came from. That's, that's what that is. They would triangulate it and wear it around their neck to remind them of the power and the mechanism of the spoken word because they knew if they got their language, again, same words I'm using on purpose. If they got their language working for them, they could go do amazing things. They could do great things. If their language was working against them, guarantee things are going to be harder than they need to be. They're going to talk themselves out of opportunity. Mm-hmm. Most people's language tricks them into thinking they are innocent bystanders in their story. No, we are participating in our story. We are participating in the story we tell ourselves about ourselves. And when we know to use less of these words and more of these words, we become a way more active and potent participant. And that's fun on top of a bunch of other stuff. I love what you said about that being an active participant and how, you know, most of us are so unconscious of this because it's like you said, it's not something that I think we've traditionally been taught about language. And then we end up in this sort of victim mindset about it as if things are happening to us, but I love it. So, so far we have the soft talk challenge. I think that I love how practical that is that everybody can do hang those words up and look at them. Um, let's talk about some of the other mechanics that you use. So when we talk about language, we mean internal dialogue and external dialogue, what we think, what we say, and, and what we write. And to review, when, when we use language, which is kind of, get the joke, consistent, <laughs> We're influencing simultaneously, basically instantaneously, our imagination, our feelings and emotions, our physiology, and how we breathe. Okay. And so when we're helping people make edits to their language, change some language in the enlifted language, it's called translating. We're translating. So we're going from, we're translating uh, uh, in, in essence, victim centric stories. Into, into an architect mentality. That's what we call it. When people become conscious, they use their words and they build things. Okay. Well, like, as in, what do you want to do with your life? What kind of people do you want to be? Or what skills do you want to develop? Um, and so another one of those uh, 
mechanical experiences, language games. It's a should detox. Third time to charm you to play the should detox, Julie. Sure, let's do it. Since we're since we're, 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 we're on a roll. Right. We're on a roll. Uh uh pick something that you should on yourself uh about. Could sound like I should meditate more or I should call my grandparents more. Most people have something that they should on themselves with. I have a lot. I'm (laughs) for those of you who do Enneagrams, I'm an Enneagram type one. So I live in the should. Yeah. We've got some of our coaches that are way into Enneagrams. (laughs) Sorry to blow the the microphone up, but that was a good laugh. Uh, (laughs) Perfect. You would just pick one should sentence, one should statement. So I should, and then fill it in, write it down. And everybody listening, like I said, most people have something they go to quite quickly. So feel free to write this down. This is also is there another layup language game? Super easy to turn around and share with a client, share with a, a, a group of people, make a post and a, whatever. Please use it. It's great. They're going to have an experience. So, what's your what's your should statement, Julie? I should go to bed earlier. Wonderful. How does that feel to say? Uh, it makes me feel really bad about myself. Got it. And when you're when you're when you're running the language games, everybody, inquire about the feelings. It's very easy for people to tell you how they feel. Okay, much easier than if you're asking about pictures and movies and things. But on a teaching side note, great. So uh, I should go to bed earlier. Take your magic wand, scratch out the word "should" and put in could. Mm-hmm. I could go to bed earlier. Any different? Sounds like a true statement. <laughs> okay. Let's keep going. Take out the could put in can. I can go to bed earlier. You how she said it different folks? <laughs> Changes the feel. Mm-hmm. Okay. So uh, relevant side story. Uh, uh, he wrote a book, uh, Dr. Robert Cialdini wrote the book, Influence the Power of Persuasion. He's one of the most sought after social psychologists on the planet currently. And they did a bunch of different studies. One of them is they went into a copy machine room back in the day during peak uh, copy hours. And they went from the back. So there's a lot of people in there needing to make copies. Let me just make that easier to understand. They'd go from the back of the line to the front of the line and say, excuse me, can I get in front of you to make some copies? They got a yes, 66% of the time. Then they added a because. They added a why. Excuse me, can I get in front of you to make some copies? Because if I get this done now, I can get it to my associate and they'll have it for the presentation. Or excuse me, can I get in front of you to make some copies? Because if I get these done now, I'll be able to make it to my daughter's recital. They got a yes, 94% of the time. So a 33% bump in, in, in buy-in, in yes. Here's where it gets funny and a little bit spooky. They go from the back of the line to the front of the line and say, excuse me, can I get in front of you to make some copies? Because I want to make some copies. Well, of course you do. They got a yes, 93% of the time. What does that mean? What? Exactly. It's almost irrelevant what, why you give yourself for what you're doing. Uh, uh, it, it, you're going to get a 33% bump in the feels. So should to could, could to can, can to can plus because. So write your can statement, put a because on the end of it, and then fill in whatever you want because it's going to be good. Oh, that's amazing. And very consistent with, as I think about just general behavior change, or as I think about, you know, in medicine, always tying behavior change back to the why, you know, why is this important to you always helps people to be more successful. 3% more successful. Wow. That's such an interesting experiment. And it turns out the why doesn't even really matter just as long as you have one. It doesn't really matter. What's, what's your why for the, the, what's your your can plus because statement? I can, Oh, I can go to bed earlier because if I do, I'll wake up earlier and be more rested. 
And I mean, I could go on for hours about that. I can then do all the things that I want to do during the day. Also known as talking yourself into stuff. Yeah. We're all talking <laughs> ourselves into stuff. We're talking ourselves out of stuff. And it's 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 fun. It's cool. It's um it's empowering to be able to identify something and talk yourself into it and know how you're talking yourself into it. Be conscious of that process. I'm a big Alan Watts fan. He's a, a Zen, was a Zen student. And I really like getting on YouTube and listening to Alan Watts with some chill step. And he said, uh, he said, when you learn, because most people think, he said, when you learn to think about your thinking, you become alive in a new way. And that's the business that we're in. We're here to help people think about their thoughts. I love this. And I think for me, as I'm thinking about personally working on some of these things, it's been more through the lens of mindfulness or meditation or bringing these things to your awareness and just being aware of them. But to me, what the exercises that you're taking me through then add another layer of, okay, I'm aware of them, but what do I do with them in order to start changing my stories, changing the way that I'm talking to myself. A thousand percent. It's the sentence on our website, practical, as in practice, practical mindset tools to unlock freedom and confidence. I love it. I love it. So two others that you have on your website, when you talk about, I think two others, um, you talk about negations and projections. Can you talk about what those are and how you would work on those? Happily. So uh, we're getting them, we're getting them all. We're getting the big three, the pillars of uh, conflict language. So uh, my business partner and I, we shot an online course in 2015 when we first started this business, and we looked at each other when it was in the can and done, and said, "We got to reshoot this," which was no small deal for two guys bootstrapping a company. Mm -hmm. And the reason we decided to reshoot it. Because before conflict language, which is what we're talking about, there's three pillars of conflict language. Soft talk, we just did that. Soft talk challenge, remember that? And there's negations and projections. Those three pillars account for roughly 85% of the language patterns that people use to cause themselves the variety of problems that they do. Before conflict language was called conflict language, it was called victim mentality language because it was accurate in, in context of the definition of the victim mentality, and it was too strong of a place to start the conversation. Okay. Because people say, oh, I'm, not a, I'm not a victim. Okay. And then you talk about conflict. They're like, Yeah, I got a little conflict at work, and you should see my marriage. So we, we reshot it. And uh, the three pillars of conflict language are soft talk, negations, and projections. And then allow me to make this very quick point. This is not definitively not victim blaming. This is victim mentality explaining two different things. One's pointing at the person. One's pointing at the book the person is reading. We're pointing at the book. Okay. Hey, these words are doing this to mm -hmm. these aspects of yourself. So negations. Here's another story. I like stories. So I'm doing a training in 2015 for a sales team in Calgary. I complete the group training and stay after and do one-on-one -on -one sessions. And I'm in a room, just a young gentleman and myself, he was 22, 23, struggling at work. And this is what he said. This is what he said. And this is what he did. He said, Mark, I can't keep focusing on my past. I had to do that. So my headset stayed on. So <laughs> All of you all listening to the audio, I just turned around and looked behind me mm -hmm. very quickly, like rigorously. It's a macro movement, not a little nose scratch. I'm looking at him and I go, dude, you know, you just turned around and looked behind you. He goes, what? And I go, yeah. What did you see? And he had to think about it. He goes, uh, I saw myself on the couch and, and all alone. And then I asked him, what you feeling? And he said, uh, I'm, 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 I'm angry and, 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 and also sad. And then I, uh, I was like, where are you breathing? He goes, oh man, it's all up here in my chest. That one sentence, 
I can't keep focusing on my past. That's negation. Negation keyword can't. It act. Remember the the four aspects that are our language influences. Mm-hmm. In one sentence, he engaged his physical body. Okay, unbeknownst to him, talk about unconscious. Turned around big time. Looked behind him. He made the picture of him on the couch all alone. Created the feelings of anxiety, anger, and sadness, and trapped his breath in his chest. And I handed him a pen. I said, write that down. He goes, write what down? That sentence, I can't keep focusing on my past. And he wrote it down. And I said, if that's what you can't keep doing, what can you start doing? And he said it like a question. Once again, focus on my future more? And I said, yeah. Now say it like a statement. And it was clunky because he had to get used to, we have to get used to using our words different until they're, until we're comfortable with them. There's a, an adjustment phase. I can focus on my future more. <sighs> Takes a sigh of relief of what pressure I can. And he starts talking himself into, I, I can focus on my future more. Now that we got the guy pointed in the right direction in his imagination, I asked him, I said, well, what, what, what can you do? And he was very, it was very quick to identify three things. He, he needed to read a couple of books. He needed to engage in the mentor program they had at work. And he needed to go to the monthly socials that they had. They go out drinking together. Okay. He messaged me eight, nine months later, something like that. And said, my entire professional life has changed. And it was because we got one sentence that was forcing him. My driving teacher said, when I got in the car at 15 and a half years old, he said, look where you want to go. Cause you're probably going to go there. <laughs> huh. No, Interesting. no. Yeah. <laughs> and, and what did we do right there, Julie? We broke a spell. Mm-hmm. Since we're talking about abracadabra, the definition of a spell is a word or a combination of words of great influence. That's Webster's definition. And I can't keep focusing on my past is a combination of words that greatly influenced that person, that man. He did that to me, combination of words that greatly influenced that, that, that woman I talked about earlier. She made me think, or he made, forgive me, he made me think we needed to get married. That's right. It was a woman saying that. Um, those are, these are spells, folks, by definition. And the fastest way to break a spell is to write it down. That's why it's so important to write out stories that are annoying you or hurting you or even haunting you. Get that thing on paper, okay? Because when, when a story is kept in your head, it is seemingly infinite. Where does it start? Where does it stop? There's the worst part. Ouch. Once you get the thing on paper, and that pen might feel like it weighs 500 pounds. I get that. It is now finite. There's a beginning word and there's an end word. And you now have distance between um, your eyeballs and the paper. And you begin this, this process of down-regulating your nervous system in context to the stories that also known as your memories that you have of your life. And most people are carrying around some stories that every time they get flirt with the idea of bumping up into uh, lock up, go the other way, go to the gym, anything, anything, but to think about that. Okay. And I understand that I lived that. And now I understand that I've got a better option, which is to, that this is a whole other conversation that we can have briefly and getting those stories written out and aired out is um, a major component of helping you retrain your reticular activating system to see, to help you see yourself as the person that you want to see yourself as, if that makes sense. It's a major component when it comes to changing the, the habitual stories, our identities, the, and, and, and well, becoming the architect. So powerful. And I've seen for myself, I, in, Oh, only until recently had not been much of a journaler, but journaling has been very useful for me. But I saw an Instagram post on your, a recent Instagram post on your account for Unlifted Coaches that said, stop telling your clients to journal and that there's a sort of a, a 
healthy or a helpful way to do it and a not so helpful way to do it. And if you just tell people to journal, it's kind of like a trainer just telling someone to go without work out without giving them any instruction on mechanics or, um, or what they should be doing. So how I, I know the first step you said is getting those stories down on paper, but what do we do from there to make sure that we're journaling effectively? When most people journal, they write generally speaking about how they feel about the thing. Okay. Now journaling versus no journaling, working out versus not working out. I'll take the workout. Totally. Okay? And if you want to take your journaling practice to a whole new level, what you want to do. And like I said, the pen could feel like it weighs 500 pounds and I'll take a little bit of sting now than as opposed to carrying this thing around for three, four decades and having it majorly influence my lens, mm -hmm. particular activating system. You want to identify the stories that still hold an emotional charge. What, what, what identify stories, let's keep this simple, that still hold emotional charge, specific events, title them like a title to the to a movie and write out what happened is in the facts what happened the devil is in the detail this is a very very rarely do people write out the facts of what happened you want to err on the side of more detail than less about uh, uh situations that you know that if it, if it hurt then it probably still hurts now and when you go through this process of externalizing your story, it's, it's there's four steps to it, okay? And it's all about down-regulating the nervous system. We're not here to tell people anything about what they should think and feel about something, okay? We're, um, we're, we're the write-it-down people, and we're, we're all, all good questions. Very important point when it comes to coaching. Answers push, questions pull. Say it again. Answers push, questions pull. You want to question, it's known as myutic teaching. You want to question and bring this stuff out of your clients, assuming that you're okay, comfortable working in an emotional uh, capacity with your clients. If you're not, I totally get that too. Right. So the first step is to title a specific memory, write it out conversationally, err on the side of more detail than less. Once it's written down, Wonderful. Read it. Out loud, normal speed. Let yourself have the feels. Step three, slow down your rate of speech by roughly 30% and read it slow. When someone slows down their rate of speech, the breathing starts to unlock and descend. You want that. As the breath descends, the feels come up. The feels, that's the glue that holds the belief system in place. I'm not good enough. Okay. No one will ever love me. Why should I even try? And those just, you know, fine. Yes. Their belief systems, that's a, a, it's a, a very clunky word. Not clunky. It's, a, um, it's just giving them a little bit too much credibility. Those are opinions. Those are ideas. Okay. They're not facts. You're not going to find, um, I'm not good enough on the periodic table of elements. You know, no, you're not going to, no, no one pays attention. Who, who would pay it? Who would, who would pay to work with me as a coach is not a unit of measurement. Those are opinions. And when they're emotionalized, um, then they become, well, matter of fact, right or wrong. That's a whole other conversation. Uh, uh, and most of the stuff that people talk themselves out of opportunity with are simply emotionally charged opinions that got set up way back then. Step one, title it, write it out. This is known as the four-step story work process. It's the, it's, the, it's the capstone, it's the crown jewel of the Enlifted Method, um, Swiss Army tool. Our coaches use it all the time. I've used it on everything from war crimes, uh, simple procrastination to war crimes and torture and a lot of unfortunate things in between because it, it, it doesn't, I'm not there to, again, I'm not there to tell anybody anything. I'm just there to help them get the story out and down regulate. Step one, title it, write it out. Step two, read it. 
Step three, read it slow, 30%. Slow down your rate of speech. The breath is going to unlock. Step four, take a breath at the end of each sentence. And what that's going to do is it's going to change your physiological, um, um, it's going to change your physiology in context to the story. And as the breath descends, the picture moves out. When the picture moves out, it goes from being subjective to objective. Story kept in the head takes up a ton of mental real estate. It's seemingly infinite. Where does it start? Where does it stop? I'm repeating myself consciously. Um, Story written out on paper, though, okay, now it's finite. Then I read it. I read it slow. And as my breathing opens up, it goes from the pictures in my face. I'm, I'm still in the story when it's, when it's, it's, it's kept in my head. Mm-hmm. As I externalize it and downregulate, I become the observer of the story. And your client or you is going to change your mind on your own. It's going to be very natural. It's going to be a very natural transition from how you thought and felt about it, uh, being a participant in the story. Time does not apply to the emotional body. Okay, That's why we can revisit something that happened 30 years ago and it feels the exact same. Okay. Until we get the story, all of this whole thing, Julie, falls under the umbrella of storytelling. Most people have little to no training about how to craft their stories, moderate their stories, curate their stories, dr- even draft. If, if it's not written down, you don't even have a draft to hand in. I mean, I was a horrible student in, in, in high school and in college because I was bored. Uh, plenty of times I didn't hand in a, a, a a, a paper. And, and most of the time it was just a first draft. <laughs> Write this stuff down, folks. I love it. Well, I want to bring us back before we wrap up to round out conflict language. So we talked about soft talk, negations. Let's finish on projections and then we'll start to wrap up. Although I feel like <laughs> I would love to keep listening to you for hours. The projections, we actually started there. So she did that to me. Okay. He never lets me think for myself. Um, she's always interrupting me. My mother treats me like a child. My mother, tr- look, look at this one, folks. And this is, this is the, the projections. This is where the real pluck in the nose comes uh, into, in, in, into play. Most people have a higher emotional attachment, uh, also known as a stronger emotional response to projections. Than they do to negations and soft talk. Soft talk is the easiest place to start because all you do is you take the word out and it's fun. It's funny. And oh yeah, I feel that. Yeah, I am procrastinating or you know, <laughs> it's like I'm drinking too much coffee. Take out the, no, I am. I am. And then, like I said, it's the gateway drug projections. That's where a lot of um, the strong emotional responses are, are held. And they're oftentimes the linchpin when it comes to the, the victim centric stories that we create. Um, my mother treats me like a child. Okay. That, well, yeah, I remember listening to that guy. There's the, my mother and then and it's definitely upsetting me. And I'm like, I want to go call her right now and take out my mother. Put an I. Ooh, I treat me like a child. <laughs> well, actually I do. Who treats me like a child more than my mom or more than I do. It's like, it's the difference between hate speech and self-hate speech. You know, who talks more trash to us than us about mm-hmm. us? It's not even a contest, but we'll, you know, uh, 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 it's, the, it's the best of news, folks, and it's the worst of news. Wow. So much here. And I really appreciate all the, like you said, the, the tools, the practical application that now I know I'll go back and use and hopefully people listening will go back and, and use themselves. Um, where can people learn more about what you do or if they want to dive deeper into this? We launched a podcast, Julie, uh, about, yeah, about, uh, 10 months ago, excuse me, 10 weeks ago, it's four coaches. Uh, and it's all about the words. It's all about the language. It's all about the story work. Um, uh, and you know, a, a, a lot of coaches listen to us. We're 
nothing like on the ranks of, of your podcast, but we got into the top 3% of podcasts in the first three, three, three weeks because people were, were sharing it. Um, there you go. That's a lot of fun. Kimberly, yes. fantastic host. Um, it's getting lifted, the getting lifted podcast. Follow us on Instagram at Enlifted Athletes, and we certify coaches. We certify coaches in a very specific aspect of coaching, which is how to dismantle, deconstruct the victim mentality and everything you need to know about that or could want to know about that. Enlifted.me. I love that. And how you're working through coaches and mostly in the fitness space, correct? Who are then coaching their clients in fitness, but naturally this, all of this stuff is incredibly important in helping them reach any of their goals. What yeah. does that certification look like? It's a 10 certification, equal parts, personal and professional development. Uh, I do, I deliver all the, the trainings. They are small batch. So 10 people per certification. And you go through a process of using the same tools that you're going to turn around and use with your clients, you, you go through a process of using them on yourself, plus some extra bells and whistles because you know we're coaches. We're going to go above, a little bit above and beyond. And so you leave with a lighter and brighter story of yourself and for yourself, first and foremost, so personal identity. And then you get a platinum level uh, uh, coaching skill, skill set. As far as tools, these are forever coaching tools. As far as as long as you're working with someone in a conversational context, knowing about conflict language, the victim mentality, rate of speech, how to navigate through people through stories that they have not written down and are causing all kinds of because there's the more stories that people have of a, a negative emotional charge that are kept inside, that's more of them that's bought into their failing. Okay. And what we want to do is we want to stack the deck in our favor. We want to get a, a majority of our identity bought into our success. And we can do that quite easily. And I'll, I'll, I'll give us a little credit too. We make the thing fun. <laughs> you perfect. play games we play games we play games it's 10 weeks the first half is brutal i'm gonna be honest i'm always honest the first half is brutal brutal and hilarious and those are words that people have used that have gone through the coaching certification a number of our students have independently and accurately described level one as brutal and hilarious mm -hmm. they're right they got the order right and um what we help it do is create breath of fresh air coaches, coaches that can go into deep waters, emotional waters with their clients and, and see them through and then crack jokes as they're getting back to shore. I love that. I love that. Well, I always wrap up with three questions at the end of the podcast. So I'd love to hear your answers to these. The first is what are the three things that you do on a regular basis that have the biggest positive impact on your health? I walk. I am a devout walker and a uh, 30 second relevant story about it. I shook my college girlfriend's father's kindergarten teacher when she shook her hand when she was 80 years old. She was five foot nothing. She had a grip stronger than mine. I was a wrestler and uh, she was sharp as tacks. And just, and just in great shape. I said, what do you do? She goes, I walk five miles a day. And so I'm like, okay, point note taken. And I started asking, um, any, anyone over the age of 75 who all the lights were on, they were in good shape. They were very mobile. They're all walkers. They're all walkers. So I said, okay, great. That's going to be the foundation of my fitness practice forever. And I made that decision seven, eight years ago. And, um, yeah, so I walk. I walk a lot. Um, we we are understepped as a culture. Um, I agree with that. How do you work that in? What does that look like in terms of your daily routines? Most days, I wake up on a walk. So I get up, drink some water, get my shoes on, and get out the door. I'm out the door in ten minutes. 
and I will, I will go walk for somewhere between 30 and 45 minutes and let my body warm up slow, let my mind come online. I'm not on any device. It's a great way not to be on devices. Right. Rocket science, leave the phone at home and go walk out the door. Okay. Um, uh, big fan of water, you know, all the, like, um, like real, real high level rocket science. So walk more, drink, drink, drink more water, better quality water. And then I speak at around 80% of the, my original rate of speech. Mm. So I slowed down my rate of speech and I kept it there because I know what happens when I speak just a little bit slower than I used to. I breathe better. I'm a much better listener. Okay. And it gives me range in my storytelling. So the only thing that I coach 99.5% of my time is dedicated to certifying coaches. I do a little bit of one-on-one coaching on the side, and that is only presentation skills. I'm a professional speaker and a professional speaking coach. And within the first 10 minutes of the first session working with someone, we are addressing rate of speech. When you slow down your rate of speech a little bit, it's going to give you more range as in you can go higher and get excited and talk fast about the things that are interesting. And then you can bring it down low. Totally. Important point. And it gives you the extra mental real estate to be able to in, inflect well and emphasize well, and also own the silence, you know, a, pausing from time to time when you're conversing with people. Uh, it's very powerful. And then it is impossible to understate the importance of being a better listener. If you want to be a better listener, slow down your rate of speech. You'll have more, you'll have more dialogues than monologues. I love it. So powerful. My next question is, what is one thing that you think would have a big impact on your health, but you haven't implemented it yet or something that you're working on? Good question. Uh, I'm in the camp of drinking too much coffee. (laughs) I love that. Um, I average a pot in the morning. But I love that you're firmly in the camp. You're not kind of sort of in the camp. <laughs> I'm not kind of sort of about anything in my life. I know, I know to, to use those words consciously, yeah. very spare. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's also part of my, 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 my makeup. I'm, I tend to overdo things. Okay. And I've just gotten better at um, choosing what I'm overdoing. Okay. I'm a big fan of overdoing things that I'm passionate about. Like I have in some senses overdone. So I've been doing this work as in story work, as in coaching, presenting and researching the power of our language and stories somewhere between full-time and overtime the whole time for the past 15 years doing this one thing. Mike mm-hmm. Bledsoe, shout out to Mike Bledsoe. He called me a one trick pony a few years <laughs> ago. Uh, and it was a compliment. And I took it as a compliment because this is the one thing that I do. Okay. This is the one thing that I do. And, um, I like, I like extremes. I like going to the extremities of things mm-hmm. the edges. That's because that's where a lot of the magic happens. In my opinion, you know, it's like permaculture. Everything happens at, at the, at the edges. Um, and yes, I, and I will be, um, I will be, I'm off coffee for July and half of August because we're shooting a, uh, uh, another online course. And I just, it, 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 I look just a little bit better on camera when I'm, when I'm off the, off the caffeine. So interesting. Yeah. Okay. yeah it's, a, it's a, it's a give and take, you know, I get up and I, and I drink coffee and go to work. It's fun. I could have <laughs> decades like signing up. Totally. And that's one thing that does negatively influence my life or my health to a minor degree. Okay. What does a healthy life look like to you? Uh, first things first, how's my sleep? First things first, how's my sleep? I sleep regardless of the amount of coffee. I, I, I won that lottery. Um, I sleep very well and, 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 and okay, fine. Getting back to the walking, my sleep improved when I started walking more. Okay. I was always a pretty good, pretty good sleeper and I sleep so, so well. 
because I walk and I breathe well and I like myself. Okay. Yeah. Fine. I've got some character flaws and things like that. Whatever. I like me, you know? Well, I love what you said too, about walking first thing in the morning and how much that also, it's not just the walking, but it's the sunlight. It's in training your circadian rhythm and how the exercise, how all of that then influences your sleep. Yep. Yep. For sure. For sure. It's, um, I like, I like how it, uh, it sets my mind in a, in a, in a very agreeable, quiet place or way when I get out the door and I just go walk. Cause I don't have to think about anything. I don't have to get up and think about what I'm doing. I already know what I'm doing before I go to bed the night before, which is get up, drink the water and put on your shoes, brah. <laughs> get out there. <laughs> yeah. No. Awesome. Awesome. Anything else to add there in terms of what a healthy life looks like or sleep for you is primary laughing, Mm -hmm. laughing. I know what it's like to not laugh. Um, and I know what it's like to be a, a overly serious person. Um, uh, and, uh, I've got, I've to, to a tangible degree, I've gotten over myself, you know, and, um, and I like laughing, uh, uh, I, I laugh way more than I used to. Um, my friends, we get my business partner. He's one of the funniest guys I've ever met. It's just, we're, we're, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, there's a lot of good vibe happening over here. Um, and it's because, uh, you know, we take the time to laugh at ourselves and, and laugh at other things too. You have to so, have fun. You gotta have fun. You know, yeah. you gotta have fun. You gotta have fun. It's a lot easier to laugh when you're breathing well, folks. I know we keep coming back to that because that is actually the through line. We're known as the mm-hmm. language. People. We might as well be known as the language and the breathing people. And gun to head, it's about the breath. Yes, mm-hmm. fine. I'm here to teach you about your words. Okay. What you do with that is up to you afterwards. Like I'm unattached in that regard. And most people, when they they get in this game, their breathing gets so it improves so much. And you know, whether you're out on a date or you're giving a prep a professional presentation or it's a sales conversation or you're coaching or it's a fitness competition. When you're breathing better, you're doing better. Absolutely. Well, thank you. This has been so enlightening for me. I'm so excited about the tools, being able to use them more. And hopefully this will be the first of of many conversations, but thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you, Julie. Awesome. Thanks so much for tuning in. If you enjoy listening to the podcast, please consider subscribing and giving it a five-star rating on iTunes. It really does help to get the word out to more people.